but we work with client governments all the time, particularly in uh, low-income countries, on how to increase tax revenue with the objective to helping some of our clients get out of aid dependency and stand on their own two feet. Um, our program is supported by two core partners, um, the International Center for Taxation and Development, ICTD, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, so what is uh, what is the idea that we're going to discuss today or unpack a bit today in terms of technology? Um, in the course of our research and our thinking, our innovative thinking, we've kind of broken uh, this program into three areas, enforcement, facilitation, and trust, and we call it EFT. <clears throat> so we think that these three dimensions of DRM work uh, uh, constructively together. Um, they can be done individually, but they are mutually reinforcing. In particular, we think that enforcement and facilitation has been a lot of work done within the bank and outside the bank, but the issue of trust and trust in institutions and trust in tax authorities is really where there hasn't been paid enough attention and why we might not be seeing that. serious advancements in DRM country level. So we're gonna try a little bit today is to highlight measures to increase trust between taxpayers and administrations, leading to a better social compact of trust between the two. Um, ultimately resulting in higher rates of tax compliance um, in a given country. So let's break it down a little bit further. So enforcement in particular, just to be clear, is really about punitive measures, uh, more auditors, uh, risk management, uh, monitoring of taxpayers, and potentially putting data out in digital format for third parties to do some accountability exercises, but it's really about um, Cheaters getting caught. Facilitation is making it a bit easier. So um, enforcement was one aspect, but then what on the positive side, what can you do to make it a bit easier for taxpayers to, to pay, to understand the rules, to file electronically, to pay electronically, to have tax returns, you know, to start from scratch, making the tax code public and easier to understand, and doing outreach campaigns to try to get the word out on what reforms have been made from year to year and how to more effectively do your tax. Payments. Trust is where, we, where we're diving in a bit deeper. Um, we've seen that enforcement and facilitation in our traditional tax reform has made some progress, but it's, it, it hits, a, a, um, hits a point where it needs some more increase, and we're thinking that um, focusing on trust aspects will, will help a bit more. Um, tax players traditionally our hypothesis that don't really trust tax authorities in most cases um, and the trust that their money will be spent in, in an appropriate fashion. Um, in some cases that's true. In a lot of the countries we work, we spend a lot of time trying to get tax authorities capacity built up, um, help them implement systems and policies and processes, um, but they don't do it particularly well. But there is an, a, evidence of tax authorities making real reform and professionalizing, but still changing the dynamic between taxpayers and tax authorities. This takes a longer period of time and maybe communications and an outreach campaign and, and showing more clear results as, as it relates to the tax contributions. So in order to, in this whole process of defining EFT, we unpack the four dimensions of trust bit in more detail. And these are the breakout sessions that we're gonna have where we can break them into component parts and have an open discussion. But the four dimensions in trust that we identified are fairness, making sure that the tax system itself is designed and administered fairly. Um, equity, are we sharing the burden across everyone so that um, certain people aren't paying more than others? A reciprocity, for that money that you do pay, are you getting services in return? And that can that build trust? And accountability, is the government taking ownership of this whole process? Are they accountable for mistakes and, and, and progress? And um, are they being responsive to what taxpayers are saying? So this program's been around about a year and a half. Um, we've done the conceptual work, which is public. If you, uh, then we'll circulate this um, PowerPoint later. But um, on the open knowledge side of the World Bank, we've published the working paper that defines the, the thinking. It has a working paper on the conceptual framework and on how we think about these things. How do we deal with tech, technical issues? How do we deal with politics? How do we deal with power? And then we've now moved into an operational phase, which is why it's good we're having this discussion. Is because we started working to do the state of Nigeria, and then we were 
Georgia trying to pilot some of this work with our clients, our governments, our partners. So the timing is right. Um, what we're planning to do is more pilots and then publish the, uh, the literature as a volume or a book through the Office of the Publisher um, as a global public good. So one of the key aspects of this publication and of our program is what is the role of technology in this conversation? And given it's going to be a cross-cutting issue, what are examples of success? Where do we need to work? Um, how do you deal with online and offline? Um, how do you deal with the sustainability of technology? And how do you deal with entrenched technology that already exists? Um, <clears throat> so anyway, that's kind of a broad brush of what the program is about and why we wanted to talk to you, Tic Tech Furs, today. Thanks, Eve. Uh, you can go to the next slide if you want. Um, so now, uh, if anyone has any questions, you can either uh, type them into the chat box. We're not um, sophisticated enough to be using Slido. Um, or you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Steve, maybe I'll uh, put you on the spot here and ask, um, maybe if you can explain a bit more about how enforcement and facil facilitation uh, and trust, how, they, how do they mutually reinforce each other and what's the relationship between them? So, um, well, I mean, that's part of, the, part of the work we're doing in, at the country level. So enforcement might be um, um, audits and maybe getting citizen perceptions of which auditing firms are selected and and how are those audits performed and who how do they select and how do they select a representative sample of, of, of individuals and corporations that are audited making that stuff public and engaging the you know, population of citizen taxpayers on that process is an example of how trust might push with enforcement facilitation is basically making things easier how do you get the word out and so quite often there might be websites and mobile apps and things like that that make the tax paying process easier. However, they're not well explained. There's no uh, proactive uh, engagement on the behalf of the tax authority to make the new rules and the simplification more clear to people. And then uh, part of what we're doing also is, is surveying in each country what the perceptions are before reform of the tax authority and then doing a perception study after the reform. Tax authorities. Let's uh, any other questions from the crowd? Uh, I might actually ask one more, uh, if that's okay. Um, if, Steve, if, if it's possible just to give a bit of context towards um, you know, why, why we're even working on this issue of um, raising domestic, uh, domestic tax revenues. What, what is the current level of domestic uh, tax revenues in developing countries compared to developed countries? Um, is this a, a major problem or a minor problem? Well, I think the reason it's been uh, highlighted within the World Bank group and divvied up amongst all the members of the World Bank group is a big issue. Rates are very low in developing countries and that is holding them back in terms of graduation from aid dependency. So it has been highlighted globally as an, an issue of focus for the next few years. Um, I guess in particular, um, at the country level, we have seen um, some of our more traditional tax reforms or technical reforms that are purely technical tend to um, maybe not take the politics and the perception amongst taxpayers as, as seriously as is needed. So we have seen, we are looking for ways and innovations in tax programs to find ways to push the needle. So that's where this program came from, was we've been doing these traditional tax reforms for some time, um, whether it be a diamond or to dot, these acronyms that they use in the tax program. But what are the non-technical drivers? Is the way we position this? What are the non-technical aspects of tax reform that can be addressed in this program? So globally, yes, it's a big issue. Um, it's, it's been a big issue for several years and it's a strategic priority for World Bank Group. Um, but then also, <clears throat> uh, how do we um, provide a next phase of our tax reforms in our current operation portfolio? And what is the role of citizen and citizen perception in that process? 
I mean, the reason we're doing the literary piece is to do an academic study to make sure it's founded in, in rigorous analysis, and then potentially do some RCTs or some follow-up research to see the before and after effects. I also have, I think, role, my colleagues rolling on are probably on the Zoom as well if they want to say a few words, but otherwise we can continue. Uh, there's another session in the chat. Uh, can you say more about how you evaluate the effectiveness of the country's reforms? It seems like um, RCTs or randomized control trials would miss the nuances of building trust. Uh, in any of our projects and programs, we do an evaluation after at, uh, several points in the process. So we do have a more traditional approach that's not RCT oriented that does an evaluation of projects, but um, a bit. Uh, Bit further after the close of the project than we're comfortable with. We also do um, basically what we call an ISR process, which is an implementation status report, which allows us to evaluate uh, the results matrix indicators um, at several points throughout the project cycle. So we do have ways to monitor and measure um, the effectiveness of reforms throughout, but um, nothing replaces kind of our country experts on the ground that. Um, can provide basically uh, first-hand knowledge of the situation and whether the reform is effective. Well, quite often we have a tax authority that doesn't have the capacity or the resources to do some of the reforms and we need to work with them very closely. Okay, so I think we can move along. Uh, Steve, you can go to the next slide. Okay, yeah, so, the, so now we're going to um, be brainstorming some ideas from the crowd from, uh, about how tech, digital tools and technology in general can be used in this area. Let's see if you can go to the next. So we see this research as potentially having quite a big impact. Um, if tax compliance rates can be meaningfully increased in low-income countries, um, of course, in conjunction with other good governance reforms, uh, it can basically um, allow for governments to have much more revenue at their disposal to implement um, higher quality and expanded public services, which you know, can make a big impact. Um, again, to date, there hasn't been much work done so far on how digital tools specifically can be used to um, bolster the trust component of the relationship between taxpayers and tax administrations. Um, this is something that we're just beginning to think through and we saw TicTech as a fantastic opportunity to um, sort of gather civic tech minds together to um, help us sort of accelerate this process and to generate some ideas. So some of the major sort of overarching questions that we have are, how can digital tools be used specifically by tax administrations to firstly to understand the level of tax morale and the root causes of low compliance and low trust amongst tax and payers? Um, how they can use digital tools to better gauge the, the service delivery preferences of citizens? And finally, how they can use digital tools to collect feedback on the provision of public services. Uh, so now I'll turn over to uh, Yasso to talk us through uh, this next uh, section of, of the session. All right. Uh, thank you, Benji. And uh, we, why we are using speculative design as a tool? Uh, it's because speculative design allows us to uh, think on future-based scenarios uh, to come up with user-centered uh, tools and platforms. So I think there's not much to say here. If you want to know more, there's a bunch of material online. Uh, you can also uh, shoot, us, shoot us an email. Uh, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, worth experimenting instead of like talking. So um, I'll go back to Benji so that we can split the, the, the rooms and uh, just uh, important notes before we start. Uh, when we split the rooms, we want you to share with us your name, your organization, 
and what's, what brings you to Tic Tac, as you can see. Uh, it would be very nice if one of you could volunteer to take notes on the, the, the uh, conversation in the, the room. And then we will read, you, read uh, the scenario that we uh, developed uh, so that we can brainstorm on these specific situations in the future. That's it. Now I'll give back to Benji so that he can split the rooms. Um, go ahead. Okay, so the four rooms are going to be uh, based on each of the four dimensions of trust um, as we've defined it. So um, we're just going to give a run overview of what the four rooms are. So I'm going to be the facilitator of the first uh, room, the first scenario, which is around fairness. So the scenario is, um, it's, the year is 2020, the current day. Um, there are voices in the government calling for digital transformation of government services, but uptake so far has been quite slow. Um, and the situation is that um, Hassan, who's a local property tax assessor, um, visits Amar to assess the value of his property. Um, Amar happens to be Hassan's second cousin. Um, and instead of making a proper assessment, uh, he artificially values Amar's property at less than the appropriate rate to lower his tax bill. So we're going to think through ways that technology can address this scenario. Okay, so uh, the next slide is on equity and the year is 2025. So you have to imagine that the country is digitizing the tax administration you have the, and you have the opportunity uh, to, to um, think about a country that's starting a, a broader digital transformation in the, in the government. We have uh, this person, Drew, it's a hard working small business owner and makes a point of running a, a business, his own business, and pay his fair share of taxes. So what happened it was that a month ago, a multinational corporation opened up a branch on his block and is offering uh, products in uh, much lower prices. So Drov is frustrated as he knows that these companies, they, offer, they often use international loopholes to avoid taxation, uh, which gives them uh, a competitive advantage. Uh, so they can lower the prices. So now Drew uh, wonders why he should pay his full share of taxes if these companies do not. So this is the equity scenario. So um, in terms of the scenario three reciprocity, um, it's about getting um, value for your tax payments. Years 2027, 20, um, there's an online system for paying taxes that reaches the majority of the population. Amanda has a company that sells online. Um, she doesn't deal with logistics, but does pay her taxes and believes that um, that is supporting infrastructure for her business, uh, roads, um, electricity, etc. She reads some social media posts saying there's been some corruption or some um, mm -hmm. lack of development in that area, and she's wondering if the government is actually taking her money. What is the association between her money and the infrastructure and the services that she received as a result. Okay, uh, so hi everyone. Um, and here we are at the last scenario, scenario number four, accountability. So the year is uh, 2035 and technology is advanced and the government is now completely digital, okay? And we have uh, here a Wentin who runs a small online business and makes her deliveries using a pressurized tunnel that relies on publicly maintained subterranean infrastructure. Okay. Uh, she has just seen that the government again has not invested in the maintenance of this tunnel, uh, which is causing delays to her deliveries. So she's a little bit frustrated. Frustra oh my God, sorry about it. Frustrated. And she feels that her voice has no real impact in the government policies, especially when it comes to public investment, right? So she feels like that, like she has no say in how tax, uh, tax dollars are spent. And she starts to wonder why she even paid taxes at all. 
Uh, so those are the four scenarios we have. Uh, we're going to be in four different groups, each group focusing on one of them. Uh, we will have like time to recap them, don't worry about it. But just keep in mind that we have constraints. So it's not like a, a, a really open brainstorm where uh, whatever is possible. So we have to take into, into account, given the, the, the year when each scenario happens, the technological constraints and political constraints. So the fact part, we have lack of universal access to a smartphone and internet connectivity. We are in 2020 and we know that, but we can imagine how it will improve or not improve in the next few years. We have also the gender and generational gaps uh, uh, regarding uh, access to internet, to mobiles, etc. We have the issue on liter uh, literacy rates for the digital, like digital literacy, um, even among officials. So maybe even the government's not as literate as we think they might be. Uh, data is uh, often not centralized or interoperable, and maybe data is low quality. So even if everything is uh, out there in the cloud or somewhere, it doesn't mean we can necessarily do much with data. And sometimes the really, really basic infrastructure is problematic, like power supply or coverage, uh, internet penetration stuff. On the political side, uh, of course, we have budget constraints to implement IT projects. Uh, we have a lack of political will here and there. Um, maybe this is just not uh, seen as a priority, especially in, in, in fragile and conflict zones. And since knowledge is power, there's often a uh, uh, few incentive to share data, creating kind of uh, uh, silos uh, based on data and information. So those are kind of reality uh, checks we are inviting you to, to take into account during the scenarios. Okay, so now we go to the groups, right? Yeah, so um, just give me about uh, 20 seconds here to set up yeah, the groups. Sure. There's gonna be, um, the, the groups are gonna be about six people per group, uh -huh. um, and we're giving half an hour, but you know, it's, we're gonna see how we go. This is all a bit of an experiment. So just bear with me one second here. Okay, so I'm going to uh, open all the rooms. Um, you should, I'm not sure if you've uh, experienced this in Zoom before, but you're automatically going to be divided up into small groups. Um, it'll be nice if you turned on your uh, video. So we, we wanted to sort of change the atmosphere and make this much more interactive in this uh, part of the, of the session. Um, and you'll have a one minute timer once, um, you know, right before it ends and then everyone's going to automatically be brought back in. So um, we'll see you all uh, after the breakout groups. Okay, so yeah, we're just going to go through each group and um, we'll have, however you want to organize it, uh, present back your ideas to the wider group. So um, I was part of the first group and I'm just going to share my screen. So we came up with uh, three proposals. Um, I'm going to go through the first, and then Ricardo is going to go through the second, and Ivy will go through the third. Um, so the, the first proposal, so again, we have the um, fairness uh, scenario, which is um, basically a, a property tax collector has given a, a more favorable rate to his cousin. Um, so one, our first idea was for a GIS, a GIS or geographic information systems, mobile app that um, inspectors can use to basically drive through a neighborhood. And instead of auditing a particular, um, spending a lot of time um, auditing one particular property, they can basically just drive through and cross-reference um, the, the tax assessment, um, property assessment data with just visually checking the homes because in, in neighborhoods, most homes tend to be of similar value. So, um, it can just be a very quick um, and low cost way to raise any red flags if one house is, is, is dramatic, paying dramatically less than a neighboring house. 
Um, so the strengths were, were that it creates disincentives for tax collectors to break rules because it raises the likelihood that they'll be caught. Um, and it's low cost and quick and auditors can cast a wider net to double check that no one's breaking the rules. Um, one weakness is that some properties might be harder to assess because there might be larger lots or visual impairments and you can't actually properly see the size of the property. Ricardo, do you want to talk through the second idea? Okay. Uh, the second idea is a website uh, about uh, the idea of asking uh, what does your neighbor pay? And the whole idea is a crowdsourcing, uh, uh, auditing of tax levels uh, where people can um, see about the contribution of uh, every neighbor uh, and seeing that they, they could uh, realize if someone is contributing less than the overall neighbor, neighborhood, the overall value of the neighborhood uh, and providing like uh, social pressure or something like that for those that are underpaying. Uh, there, is, there is a weakness about privacy issues. Uh, we discussed the, some, a little bit about that, that uh, in the group, but because you're gonna ex uh, exploit, you're gonna uh, undercover uh, what is the, the, the level of the, the tax that the, the people are paying. And so there is a worry, but uh, something, in, at the same neighborhood, you have some uh, some uh, approximately values. So maybe it's not a big privacy issue, but it is uh, definitely a one. That is. Okay, Ivy. Okay, so our third proposal was awareness campaign on social media. So the social media campaign is on how do I contribute to the public investment my community receives. Um, the message is built based on contribution ranking, being well, being well ranked citizens that contribute on an expected level of property value and citizens that lower their property value will in consequence be contribution, be contribute less and will be less ranked. The ranking is made based considering the geographic areas that have an approximate value of property. Um, so they will, not be pen they will not penalize people that live in low valued areas compared to those who live in high valued areas. So one of the strengths is that it, it's a, it increases awareness to taxpayers and as well as uh, capacity to share your contribution to networks. One of the weaknesses that uh, with this proposal is that it could be subject to fake news and needs a website to fact check. Great, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. So that was the first group. Um, so does someone from the second group want to tell us what you discussed? So the second group was uh, equity. Uh, we had a conversation actually about uh, the situation in Ukraine uh, in which uh, the revolution, let me share my screen. We did not write a lot of things, but um, we had a conversation on how the revolution allowed uh, the, I mean, opened the opportunity to implement better controls uh, and more transparency in terms of who pays uh, um, what amount of taxes. So uh, I don't know if Nadia is here. Nadia, do you wanna jump in and talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, hello, everyone uh, from Ukraine. Uh, so uh, 
uh, after revolution of dignity in 2014, now uh, we like a civil society and people who tried to who wanted to make reforms regarding tax service and other services uh, yeah, public services uh, they had an opportunity the room like for 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 these uh, uh, changes and uh, you now we started the regulation procedures and open opening up a lot of data for example state business register is open is open now the uh, now in ukraine beneficial on Ownership information is also open. Information about um, some like tax returns and other, like not all of them, but some uh, tax issues are uh, also open in, in open data format and is used by business to help business and to provide like services to other business, for example, to inform about your, your business. Um, partner or about uh, company other companies um, whether this company has any tax debts or whatever uh, or um, uh, else and uh, uh, we also have a, like governmental tool where you as a business can track all information regarding your business for example uh, what kind of documentation documents do you need to open and uh, lead your business, what kind of checks you will have and what you should have. And regarding this concrete issue, it's about how local government can support these small businesses because local governments has uh, some programs to support small businesses. It's about access to this information. Uh, and uh, this tool also provide this information about uh, like some kind of programs or um, tax uh, like return programs or whatever which is done by local government and it also can be used uh, like this access to this information can be used uh, by uh, Dhruv Dhruv uh, to, to not be so frustrated about the situation and we also have a big movement regarding the beneficial ownership transparency and this also can help to get information who gets uh, um, uh, who gets revenue from these uh, um, low uh, low tax uh, taxes for big corporations to find that information about these uh, corporations who owns and who has influence on this uh, corporation political side that's great. Thank you so much, Nadia. Uh, Arthur uh, also sorry. brought the... Sorry? No, no, I just have a comment at the end. Go ahead. No, but go ahead. Jump in, Steve. No, I wonder, in a, like, one of the challenges we always have with this is how do you move from um, blaming governments to providing them opportunities to do better things? So one of the things I was thinking of in terms of technology and the equity field is showing governments how much revenue they could collect if they were more evenly distributed, right? Well, what are the opportunities for equity, right, in terms of revenue generation? So maybe they just don't know that they're not targeting the middle class as effectively as they could be. Maybe they, they are aware that they're not taxing the kind of network individuals and they know why that is, but they're not hitting certain demographics that they could be much more effective at. So, you know, how do we have make this conversation with governments more constructive Unless about just you know? I'm just uh, I just want to add that now our community I'm like coordinating open data community in Ukraine now we are fighting for opening up uh, financial reports of companies so like financial data of companies to have more information about uh, like state of business in Ukraine. And this can uh, provide more arguments for business, for small and medium business uh, 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 in discussion with government regarding, for example, some kind of tax, prog tax, tax revenue or tax cut programs for small and medium business to show the real situation um, in, in some countries. Okay. Anyone has uh, uh, anything to add, Arthur or Nadia? So we also had a quick brief chat on how to uh, regulate wealth uh, managers and how, how to create a political will to, to, to create this regulation. So I think uh, 
we talked about how equity can be a tool to leverage uh, uh, to, to leverage this conversation that Steve is talking about, uh, because sometimes uh, transparency helps uh, in in bringing knowledge closer to uh, the representatives. So I think that was our conversation. We didn't really come up came up with uh, prototypes or or apps or proposals. But uh, we had this uh, enriching conversation. So I think, uh, thank you for uh, those who participated. That's great. Um, so now group three, but also we're running a, bit, uh, um, running a bit behind on time. So if we can just maybe have two or three minutes for the last two groups. Um, hi, this is uh, Anders. Um, uh, Steve and Roland and I discussed uh, how to deal with reciprocity. Uh, and uh, after basically the issue is um, how do we create a formal link between taxes on one side and services on the other? Because they're very separate. Tax administrations are not involved in services. So how do you do that? So we talked about the use of surveys. Um, to see the, uh, you know, can we create uh, some kind of a dashboard by getting data from mobile phones or surveying citizens or, or having some kind of kiosk whenever they get uh, service from the tax administration somewhere else to get get some of this data, maybe building on household uh, surveys. And it also gives us an, an opportunity to bring in more sensitive questions like uh, issues around informality. Uh, Roland brought up a very interesting question, which is, um, uh, do we actually know that the quality of public services have an impact on the willingness to pay? So that is also something we could we could look at. But with this survey data, you know, ostensibly creating a link between taxes on one side and, and services on the other, the question is, for what purpose? So we talked a little bit about, uh, can we use it for resource allocation? Uh, so, for example, if a small part of the taxes go to uh, areas where there have been the largest improvement in public services, a kind of a performance award, or uh, what if there is very low compliance rate or taxpayer morale, can that lead to reduced, uh, you know, transfer payment to those areas? Obviously, there are a number of PFM issues in that, but what we did was try to grapple with the issue of the so what. So, if we survey people, uh, uh, on, on the public services, is that just nice to know or does it actually lead to something? Obviously, we have a vast experience in, in surveys and we have a good understanding of tax and taxpayer morale, uh, but it, uh, it's uh, unclear what authority the tax administration has to go into these type of issues that really uh, fall between that and the rest of, of, the, uh, of the government. So, so let me hand it over here to to Roland and and Steve to to add to to that summary. Um, if you want for me, go go ahead. Uh, just to say that surveys, whether that's an online survey, a voice-based response survey via mobile phone or a kiosk in the ministries themselves, so, you know the the technology to deliver that survey and response is. Uh, be determined it could be a mixed method and, and this is something we're looking at in a p4r operation in morocco how to do this throughout all of the the thematic areas you have highlighted here so if anybody has some smart ideas on how to get the data what kind of data to get and how to to make sure it's acted on would very much like to hear that one contribution from the equity um, breakout group um, in the the large multinationals that can uh, hire wealth managers to um, put their assets in tax havens. And this creates the um, disparity between the small, medium-sized businesses and individuals who ha have to pay taxes and they feel like it's not fair because these other people can avoid it. So the result of um, a study of the uh, wealth management industry the professionals that do this work, um, the conclusion they came to is that it's these assets are too effectively hidden. It's too difficult to um, uh, re regulate and, and punish the, the um, corporations that are doing this because it's effectively legal. 
So the, the only um, mechanism that is, is available is to, uh, regul to have the state regulate the profession of wealth management. And so the, the equity piece would be to create the, the public will to um, force the decision make the authorities to regulate this industry. Let me also add, we've seen in a number of countries that connected firms are able to negotiate more favorable uh, taxation rates. Uh, uh, Bob Rikers and others uh, did a survey in Tunisia. It's also the case elsewhere. Uh, a, a variation of that is economic free zones where especially foreign companies come in, the government is happy to get the jobs, maybe they get the jobs, maybe they don't, they end up not paying taxes is a variation of that. And the smuggling is also, some companies are allowed to smuggle and it hurts uh, local industry that play by the rules. So these are variation of, of the, it's not fair, horizontal fairness issues in the private sector. Uh, we also uh, had, just before I hand over, um, we also had this issue of informality. I don't know if we covered it, Andrews, on how maybe we could, um, we did this in Brazil, is, through surveys, don't um, ask questions that highlight the level of informality, which we think increases costs. So how many bribes, what kind of informality do they have to go through to get the service? Then maybe instead of indicating every individual who had paid a bribe, you'd actually give it a rating so that governments would see areas of higher levels of informality and then resource them accordingly. But some way to kind of with the limited resources, give governments the ability to focus on areas of larger informality. Main corruption. <laughs> okay, great. Let's move to the fourth group. Okay. Uh, we also had like mostly a, a long discussion, then a, a proper work on project types or something. Uh, Sarah, are you uh, comfortable in sharing? Yes, sorry, oh. I had to get back to oh. the screen and unmute myself. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, so we had an interesting conversation about the scenario and from the description of the um, of the infrastructure, we assumed that there were uh, that this was a fairly technologically robust uh, community that was being shared here. Um, so we we went with a scenario uh, a solution um, that we thought would meet the needs of of this particular community. Um, they're using pressurized tubes to have, you know, through a vast shipping network, um, there's online sales, um, and, and yet there's a, a lack of trust um, around how taxpayer dollars are being spent and um, what, and a lack of accountability, it seems, um, because citizens are noticing, residents are noticing um, uh, some failures in the services that they, they feel like they're paying for. So, um, our tool proposal um, came together around the idea of, of leveraging uh, chatbots or virtual assistant service that would run through you know, whatever um, platforms are, com are commonly available at that time. So maybe that still is WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger. Maybe that's evolved to something else. Um, but that a, a chatbot or virtual assistant would um, one be promoted well through um, the tax system's various touch points with taxpayers? So maybe that's in their billing process, tax collection, collection agents, etc. Um, and I, and then the chatbot could answer questions um, around how their tax dollars are being spent. Could provide more personalized responses and um, and really do a, a q and a as as someone who would be really knowledgeable in their tax system um, would be capable of doing and then um, in that that chatbot process um, proactively share so not not waiting around for a um, a taxpayer to ask a question of like well who can I talk to about this um, 
but proactively sharing on there. Um, you know, if you'd like to engage with your tax system more, or if you'd like to engage with your lawmakers, basically providing clear points of contact to ask follow-up questions or to share challenges or share concerns and to have various levels of sort of stakeholder engagement that can meet citizens where they're at and that these aren't windows of engagement they're ongoing um, resources for for taxpayers to use so that they're they're gaining a better sense of how their taxpayer tax system is working right now um, and can offer constructive feedback on you know as we see in this scenario where a taxpayer is really concerned about how um sort of poorly run uh infrastructure is impacting their business and um and so um we also identified some strengths and weaknesses with that um eduardo did you want to share that the, the strengths and weaknesses uh yes just a minute let me just find the screen here and Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, no worries, no worries. And here it is. Uh, no, not yet. Uh, this one. Okay. You can see it, right? Nope. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Uh, sh should I go on uh, on, on that? Or, sure. Uh, okay. You'd okay. Like to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like uh, part of the conversation was uh, basically from our uh, experience, like the, the the three people from the group, and uh, it usually uh, we've seen good results when people know uh, they have an entry point to talk about uh, an entry point in the government to discuss issues. So. The government's not something uh, far away from them, kind of inaccessible. They, they have this open door. Um, so like this feeling of being part of the government or at least uh, being, having the door open for them to ask questions is important and we've seen, we've seen that as a strength. Um, also the idea that this is not a, um, a product with uh, um, it's mostly a platform, it's not a, a fixed uh, thing with a beginning and end that will tackle the thing, but a process to read like citizens and, and, and govern can extend information constantly. Um, there's a sort of weakness in the sense that we are not literally talking to every taxpayer, we are focusing on a, a kind of focal point people who are interested and who actually uh, go for the chatbot or for this virtual uh, voice assistant and, and discuss the, the issues. Um, but at the same time, we see that this has been working here and there. So even today, 2020. And finally, maybe it's just uh, one more bot we have to deal with that is not this human relationship that we believe it's the best way to do it. So on the one hand, we can escalate this thing, but we may lose the, the personal touch, the human touch there. Thanks. Um, okay, does anyone have anything else to add before we wrap up? Okay then, um, before we wrap up, I also want to apologize. I know that some people tried to join during the breakout group part and for some reason there was some technical glitch which I didn't understand where I couldn't actually get people in. So I, I apologize for that. Um, you know, it was kind of heartbreaking. I could see people waiting to join and I couldn't do anything to, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but besides that, uh, thanks everyone for your contributions. Um, Steve, did you want to maybe just give some closing thoughts? Yeah, so the plan is, as I said before, um, we are doing a lot of pilot work at the country level and we'll be doing so for the next few years. Um, we're also gonna have a cross-cutting piece of literature on the role of technology and EFT or enforcement facilitation and trust. So 
what we're going to do is collate some of the information we've gotten here and maybe report back with a, a single document with some ideas that we are going to experiment with or we'll consider. But um, uh, thank you very much for your time. I know it's the end of a, of a long tick tech day, probably sitting <laughs> at your desk, you know, on virtual. So um, appreciate it. It won't be wasted. Uh, we are going to uh, take these into consideration as we further the program and do country work. And feel free to reach out to any of us if you have further questions. Uh, we'll be certain on the materials, right? So, thanks. Okay. Great. Yeah. So, thanks everyone again for coming. Um, we'll see you tomorrow at Tic Tech, day two. Um, we'll share the link to the recording and to the four Google Docs, um, I think, on the Tic Tech 2020 main hub. Um, and I think that's it. So, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.